not only uh, can't I give a good explanation in a short time, I actually don't know a good explanation uh, to give at this level. Um, uh, but, uh, um, but I'll tell you the, the, the sort of standard picture people draw. Is, is to say that, to imagine that the world is filled with some kind of, uh, of is, world is, is filled with some kind of fluid or, or condensate, and that the electron as it moves around bangs into this condensate every now and then, and that's what gives it uh, its uh, inertia. Other particles bang into the condensate um, with greater strength and are therefore heavier, like particles like the top quark. Whereas the photon, for good reasons, has no interaction at all with this and therefore is exactly massless. Uh, I don't like that way of describing things because it makes anyone uh, think and ask about the ether. <laughs> Isn't this just like another ether? And the best I can say is, it's a condensate that's not like the ether. <laughs> uh, um, it looks exactly the same to all observers, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it would be nice to have a, a better explanation um, uh, but, uh, to, to give at this level. Unfortunately, I, I don't have one. But then it, it might suffice. Uh, um, uh, for these purposes. Anyway, the typical length scale of these interactions, the typical distance these things go before they bang into this condensate is around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. So I told you this number 10 to the minus 17 centimeters is actually a length scale in nature. It has some meaning. Um, this is a fact about the world, that particles moving around interact with this condensate every 10 to the minus 17 centimeters or so. This would have been a fact, it was a fact 700 years ago, it'll be a fact 3,000 years from now. Um, but it just so happens that we're living in that epoch where we're about to probe experimentally this distance of around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. So, uh, and that means that uh, we'll put, by banging things into each other, by, uh, 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 by probing these short distances, we'll put little ripples in this condensate, the typical wavelength of around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. And those will be interpreted as a production of new particles, excitations of this uh, condensate. That's the uh, infamous Higgs that everyone keeps uh, talking about and which I've bet a year's salary uh, will be seen. Unfortunately, I did that in jest, and I still get every week now, with in, uh, alarmingly increasing frequency, emails from around the world of people willing to take me up on this bet. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I'll, I still make it. But uh, the, the, this, the Higgs or something like it really must, must be seen. Um, uh, otherwise, very dramatic things, uh, quantum mechanics is wrong. Uh, so that's, that's not going to happen. All right, so that was, uh, that was a lightning review of the last 100 years, um, uh, setting, setting the stage for what we now think of as some of the uh, uh, main challenges. So let me first uh, talk about the trouble with space-time. The trouble, once again, has to do with my magnifying glass. Um, so let's say we want to, uh, so, so quantum mechanics told us that we can't talk about positions and the velocities of particles at the same time. But we can certainly talk about arbitrarily short distances if we like. All we have to do is use higher and higher energies by the uncertainty principle to probe what's going on at shorter and shorter distances. And sure, we'll make particles and antiparticles, we'll see what's going on. In fact, that's what it means. We'll probe what's going on at shorter and shorter distances. We just need a more and more powerful magnifying glass. We beg for more and more money from big government, and hopefully they give it to us, and we, we, we keep going. But uh, there doesn't seem to be any obstruction just from this argument, just relativity and quantum mechanics, by themselves don't give you an obstruction to going to arbitrarily short distances. But gravity, relativity, and quantum mechanics do give such an, do give such an obstruction. And the reason is that at some point, you put more and more energy into a smaller and smaller region of space. Now, you know what happens. So E equals mc squared. So that energy has some mass. It has some gravity. And you know what happens if you put too much mass into a fixed region of space. It'll eventually have so much gravity that nothing can escape from it. It collapses into a black hole and you can't see anything about what's going on inside. So that's exactly what's going to happen to us here. Uh, we are trying to probe what's going on at shorter and shorter distances. We put more and more energy into a smaller and smaller region of space, until at some point there was so much energy into such a small region of space that what we're trying to look at and see the inside of and probe the inside of actually collapses into a black hole, so we can't do it anymore. You can ask, when does that happen? That happens when the distances we're trying to probe is around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So this means that, now, what happens if you say, shoot, uh, I'll just try harder. I'll build a bigger accelerator, a more powerful microscope. I put even more energy into that region. What will happen? You'll just make a bigger black hole. So, so every attempt at probing what's going on inside is foiled. 
And in fact, if you go to even higher and higher energies, instead of probing shorter and shorter distances, you make life worse for yourself. You can only have access to longer and longer distances because this black hole gets bigger and bigger and obstructs you from seeing more and more of the region you were trying to look at. So normally, of course, you could always take the attitude that, that those short distances in space and time are really there, we just can't measure them. Uh, but every time this sort of thing has happened to us before in physics, it has meant that the quantity we're trying to describe actually doesn't really exist. Okay? So the thing that we're trying to characterize doesn't really truly fundamentally exist. In this case, what's disturbing about it is the thing that doesn't fundamentally exist is the space and time itself. So that means that, again, it's the end of this, it's the end of short distance physics. Space time has got to come out from something, but how? So this is, this is the subject of, uh, uh, it's one of the many aspects of the problem of putting uh, quantum mechanics and gravity together. Again, this would make for an entire uh, talk or sequence of talks uh, um, by itself. But uh, to uh, briefly summarize the situation, uh, in all the years that anyone has thought about it, the only idea that makes sense, um, that even begins to make sense for abridging this divide, um, are the various, uh, or, or the collection of ideas revolving around string theory. Um, so in the original picture in the 80s, the idea was that particles weren't points but little loops of string, which might be 10 to the minus 33 centimeters or a little bit bigger, but somewhere, somewhere around there. And later it was realized that it's not really, even though it's still called string theory, it's not a theory of strings. There's uh, all sorts of other objects in it, um, higher dimensional objects as well. Uh, it involves many, uh, many ideas beyond things that we've seen, including extra dimensions of space. Uh, very importantly, the idea of supersymmetry was born in string theory. It's, uh, it's a very, very important uh, element of it. We'll come back to talking about it in a second. Um, but again, the original, the, the, the original idea was roughly speaking that, that, that the particles are, are loops which are a little bit bigger than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and they can interact nicely with each other and these little black holes that we're talking about would be smaller than the loop of string and wouldn't eat it up. Okay, so there was some sensible way in, uh, of uh, imagining these uh, uh, slightly bigger than Planck length strings interacting with each other in some meaningful way. And later that idea got uh, greatly, greatly generalized. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the really remarkable things happened in the mid-90s, um, was called the uh, duality revolution, that in fact there was one underlying theory, um, one underlying inherently quantum mechanical theory that has many, many solutions and many, many different classical limits. So amongst other things, it, 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 it uh, exploded the idea that you start with a classical theory and you quantize it. There's one underlying quantum theory with many, many interesting different, uh, uh, different classical limits. And uh, the collection of these things uh, evolved into the, the, most, the most interesting statement of all, um, which was that at least in some circumstances, what we used to think of as deep, mysterious, complicated um, uh, dynamics of quantum mechanics and gravity, um, in, in, in a d plus one dimensional world, let's say quantum gravity in a four dimensional world, was in fact exactly equivalent to what seemed like a more boring, completely understood theory of ordinary particles and forces, uh, quantum field theory. Just the same kind of theory we talked about that people invented in the 1930s. <laughs> okay, just putting together quantum mechanics and relativity, ordinary particles, nothing fundamentally mysterious about it. Um, but that theory in lower dimensions was equal to a theory of quantum mechanics, gravity, strings, extra dimensions, the whole shebang in higher dimensions. And again, this is something that would take a whole talk uh, all by itself to describe in, in detail, but the slogan is very important. Um, so, uh, of course, it's not a, a complete, it's not a totally random theory of quantum gravity, it's a theory of quantum gravity that lives in a particular kind of negatively curved d plus one dimensional space, but in a very specific sense, everything that's going on inside that d plus one dimensional space is entirely describable by some completely ordinary quantum field theory not completely ordinary, it's in, in some relatively extreme region of its uh, parameter space, but still, something you could, in principle, put on a computer, we understand it well enough, we could simulate, it's all completely understood physics. This completely understood physics is, is totally equivalent to this very, very mysterious uh, and ununderstood physics. So this is just the, is an incredible fact, uh, I think completely, completely un unanticipated incredible fact. Um, and it's had many, many ramifications. Another way of saying the slogan is that string theory, quantum gravity, is particle physics. Okay. So 
these, these, these ideas that seem to be very different are actually very intimately and deeply related to each other. Uh, now, of course, th this is the invariant physics statement. Uh, there is a less interesting but uh, amusing sociological fact associated with this, that since this realization, uh, there aren't really different camps in theoretical physics anymore. <laughs> It, there's, it, there aren't string theorists and particle theorists. And there's one big structure, good ideas in theoretical physics. Okay? And that structure has many different facets, and you can work on different parts of it, but it's all connected. Um, and it, it, it's, it, you can really see it in the way, in, in the, way that the field developed since the late, late 90s. Really, there's one uh, where we're much, much more one big happy family. <laughs> Than, than, than was the case in the uh, 1980s. Well, I should say, of course, there are still people who do bad theoretical physics, <laughs> uh, but they're not at the Institute. <laughs> so all good ideas in theoretical physics are combined in one very big structure that no longer is there such a big difference between strings, uh, quantum field theory. There is just some, what, what's, what's incredible, this is what I mentioned uh, in the beginning, what's incredible is that this theories, this class of theories that were basically invented by our friends in the 1930s have so much richness and structure in them that they're capable to do this. Okay. So that's really telling us, that's really telling us something extraordinary about, about nature. So of course, in, in, this, in this area, there's still an enormous amount to understand. Um, what I told you really solves the problem of quantum gravity in this particular kind of space. Um, um, amongst the people who do bad theoretical physics are the people who don't actually believe that this problem is solvable, but it's actually been solved <laughs> in one class of situations. It's just done. It's good to know that problems are solved so you can move on to unsolved problems. Uh, but there are many problems that are not solved. We don't understand uh, some of the most interesting questions where these issues should become significant. What happens near the beginning of the universe? What happens at the Big Bang? Uh, what happens near the center of black holes? How do we think about cosmology uh, combined with quantum mechanics more generally? There are lots of very, very deep conceptual problems that, that uh, in many of these problems, we don't even really know how to make a, uh, make, make a reasonable start. For some of them, we do, and so people have been making a start. And something else I told you is that uh, uh, one, of the, one of the most remarkable things that came out in the mid-90s was that there was one quantum theory with many, many solutions and many different classical limits. But that raises the possibility, which one of all these many, many solutions are we? So that's, that's another very important question to which we don't have an answer right now. And finally, along the lines of what I was advertising, uh, understanding, fully understanding, uh, putting together 